Ah, bonjour, mes amis. Je suis Claude Monet, le grand painter français. Welcome to Honfleur. I am pleased to meet you. Did you know that some people think I am the most famous, the most popular artist in the whole world? I have produced 2,000 paintings in my lifetime, and my garden at Giverny is a mecca for tourists. My exhibitions attract thousands and thousands of people, and my paintings sell for millions of pounds. But it was not always like that. The beginning was very different. My story starts in Paris. I was born here on the 14th of November, 1840. My father is a successful businessman. His name is Adolf, and he runs a grocery store. My mother is a trained singer. Me, I'm just a toddler, but I love drawing. And when I reach five years old, my father decides there's more opportunities for his business in the north of France. So he hires lots of horses, carts, and carriages, and we move all our belongings to Le Havre on the coast. My father's business is doing really well, so he buys a big house overlooking the sea, and we all settle into a very comfortable lifestyle. My father, though, has got big ambitions for me. He wants me to work really hard and become a wealthy businessman like him. But I have other ideas. Rather than staying at home working, when I'm a teenager, I prefer to go out here by the sea, on the cliffs, drawing the ships, the boats, anything that comes into the harbour, drawing the skies. That's what inspires me. I didn't much like school, because the problem with schools, as you know, is it's full of teachers telling you what to do all the time. I just wanted to draw. I used to draw the teachers. I used to make caricatures of them, make them look silly, give them big noses. I used to take them down to the local park shop, this one here, and they would sell them for 15 francs each. I saw lots of them. One day when I was 16, I was down at the beach painting when a man approached me. His name was Eugene Boudin, a local artist. He showed me how to use oil paints properly. He showed me how to mix the paint, how to apply the paint, how to create textures. But more importantly, he told me to look. He told me to look at the sky, look at the light, capture the light, work outside. That's the best way to paint. He also encouraged me to work in the streets, to look at the shapes, the perspective, the angles. Look at the light, how it affects the buildings. He said, capture that on your canvas. That's what you need to do. Eugene and I became lifelong friends. Shortly after my friendship with Eugene Boudin began, my mother became ill and she died shortly afterwards. I was heartbroken. My schoolwork suffered and I couldn't really come to terms with my grief. My father decided that perhaps it would be better for my recovery if I left the family home and I went to live with my rich aunt, Marie-Jean Lacadre. My aunt was very strict, but she did encourage my drawing. My father, though, had other ideas. He wanted me to join the army. And at the age of 21, I signed up for seven years. But after two years, I caught typhoid and I needed a way out of the army. Claude, listen, I will buy you out of the army and provide you with an allowance, but you must promise me that you will complete your art studies, work hard and be a very good boy. But my father won't agree to me becoming an artist. I'll talk to your father. So I come to Paris to become an artist. My aunt wants me to go to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the finest art school in France. But I've decided not to go there. I've come here to the Academy Suisse. It's free. And it's full of young artists with new ideas. It's not stuffy like the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And besides, I've now got an allowance to spend. The 
The studios at the Academy Suisse were small, and we all had to work very closely together. But we all got on so well. And it was here that I met my fellow artists and lifelong friends. August Renoir, Alfred Sisley, Edouard Manet, and Frédéric Basile. I've been painting now for nearly four years, but without much success. My father thinks it's time I got a proper job. I don't have any money. I had to give this painting here to my landlord, all rolled up, because I had no money to pay for the rent. Painting's an expensive business. Luckily, Basile gives me 50 francs a month to supplement my aunt's allowance. He tells me I should stop spending, stop wasting money. I've got a girlfriend. She's called Camille. She's an artist model. My father and my aunt dislike her intensely. They think I should go out with a girl from a good middle-class background. You see this painting here? This is my painting of Camille. My aunt doesn't know that this is Camille. It's a life-size painting. It's big. I'm going to enter it for the Salon. The Salon is the greatest art exhibition in the whole of France. If you can get a painting into the Salon, you've really arrived as an artist. It's a madhouse there. It's full of thousands and thousands of people. So do you know what I did? I told the press that I painted this painting in four days. They wrote an article. They said, it's impossible. This new young artist has managed to paint a picture that big in four days. It's impossible. But it got into the salon. My father thinks I have arrived as a painter, which is great. Do you know how long it really took me to paint the picture? Five months. My painting of Camille sold for 800 francs, but the money soon went, and we still live in poverty. I spent the summer of 1868 at my father's house in La Havre. I painted this picture of him on his terrace. He doesn't know that Camille is pregnant. A couple of days ago, I received a letter from her begging me to come back to Paris to help with the birth. But if I go back to Paris, my father finds out everything. He'll probably cut off my allowance, we shall have no money. I decided to go back to Paris. I saw my son Jean born. I stayed there for four days. But then I went back to Le Havre to stay with my father. I wrote begging letters to Basile and to Renoir, begging them for a loan. I hate being poor. I hate not being able to provide for my family. My father and my aunts no longer give me an allowance. We have to survive on the money I make from the few paintings I sell and handouts from Basile and Renoir. I work outside all the time. Evening weather like this, it's so cold. I'm working on this painting here of the magpie. When it's finished, I'm going to enter it for the salon. Hopefully it will be accepted and it will sell. I'm still not selling too many paintings and things haven't improved financially. But after borrowing some more money from Basile, I decided to marry Camille. We married in Paris. We spent our honeymoon on the coast in Trouville, paid for by Manet and Basile. Whilst I was there, I took the opportunity to paint people on the beach. I also spent some time painting the hotels. But at the end of our stay, we left very late at night. In fact, we crept out of the hotel without paying the bill. I run out of money. A month later, disaster struck. I couldn't face another stint in the army. So we left France. We went to England. We stayed in a shabby hotel in London. I did some painting. 
My friend Pizarro came too. While in London, I received the sad news that Basil has been killed in battle. My best friend is dead. But two things happened in London that were to change my life. Firstly, I saw paintings by Constable and Turner, the English artists. What wonderful landscapes. What sublime skies that Turner painted. He had the, obviously the same ideas we did about exploring light and capturing light on canvas. His paintings were wonderful. I also met Duran Ruel, the art dealer. He likes my work. In fact, he likes the work of my friends too. Renoir, Sisley, Manet, Pizarro. He's also bought some of my paintings. In 1871, the war ended. And in May of that year, after spending a short time in Holland, we returned to France. We stayed in a small village called Argenté, just outside Paris. And it was here that I lived and worked closely with my best friend, Renoir. We went outside every day and painted. We painted light and tried to capture light on the canvas. We discussed new painting ideas, techniques and methods. And it was during these discussions that we realised that the restrictions placed on painting by the Salon no longer appealed to us. We wanted to bring to the public our new ideas, our new ways of seeing, our new ways of painting. We are going to revolutionise art. Sometime later, the idea of having an exhibition of our own began to take shape. Pissarro, Sisley and other of our like-minded friends could come and join us in the show. All we needed was somewhere to exhibit our paintings. And that's when Renoir mentioned his friend, the photographer, Nadar. Our first exhibition opened at Nadar's studio in the Rue Capacine in Paris. We called ourselves the Anonymous Society of Artists and during the month the exhibition was open we had over 4,000 visitors. But we made a loss. With the few paintings we sold selling for as little as 100 francs each. I was just telling myself that since I was impressed there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom what ease of workmanship. <laughs> a preliminary drawing for a wallpaper pattern is more finished than this seascape, this so-called impression. Th th these paintings are nothing more than an insult to the intelligence and taste of the public. He thinks our paintings are an insult to the public, nothing more than mere impressions. So. If we paint impressions, then perhaps we are impressionists. That's it. Why don't we call our new style of painting impressionism? Duran Duel is having money problems. He's not buying many paintings. And the sale of my work is not going very well. I'm struggling financially. Renoir keeps telling me to cut down on my spending. I've got a wife, Camille. She likes nice things. At our second exhibition, I met a man called Ernst Hoshende, a wealthy department store owner. He bought Impression Sunrise for 800 francs. He's also commissioned me to paint four murals at his house, the Chateau de Rochenberg, in the south of Paris. It was at the chateau I met his wife, Alice, and the rest of his family. Camille and I became great friends with them. I spent the next 10 months at the chateau, working on the four large paintings. But in late 1877, there was a banking crash and Ernest was declared bankrupt. He had to sell his art collections and his beautiful chateau. They lost everything. 
I felt so sorry for them. So I invited Ernest, Alice and their three children to come and live with us in our little house in Venchoy. It was very cramped, but we all got on well together. The house is ever more crowded, as two more infants have now joined our families. Jean-Pierre was born to Alice four months ago, and Camille gave birth a month ago to Michel. Someone remarked that the two looked very similar. I've no idea why. What do you think? Living in such cramped conditions is putting us all under a great deal of strain and pressure. We've not seen Ernst for months. Apparently, he's gone to Belgium. And Camille, I'm worried about Camille. She's getting very ill. A year later, Camille died. She was just 32 years old. I painted this picture of her as she lay peacefully. I was at the deathbed of a lady who had been and still was very close to me. Yet I found myself staring at her, working out the proportions of light, of colour and of tone. <laughs> For the next few years, I threw myself into my work. I want to make this a success. I've got to become successful. I am sick of being mired in poverty. Alice is here, looking after all six children. She's doing a sterling job. Ernest, well, he seems to have abandoned her. He seems to have disappeared. So I now have to care for all of them and provide for all of them. So it's essential I make my paintings a success. I've made a big decision. In fact, I've made two big decisions. Firstly, I'm gonna stop exhibiting with the Impressionists. They're really angry about it, but that's nothing I can do about that. I'm gonna exhibit on my own, have my own one-man shows, so that I have control over the look of the show. I've also decided to start selling paintings to Duran Ruel's great rival, Georges Petit. Hopefully the two of them, between them, can sell more paintings. You hear all that noise? I can't work at home with all the screaming children. I need some peace and some tranquility. So I came here to lay Tretac on the coast. It's beautiful. Peaceful. Like a paint. I stayed here for a couple of months and produced around 30 paintings. I also wrote detailed letters to Alice every few days, telling her what I was doing and inquiring about the children. I thought that would keep her happy. The 30 paintings I produced were part of the 56 pictures I exhibited at Duran Ruel's gallery at the end of the year, but not many sold. I don't think he advertised the exhibition enough. Still, he's given us some money so we can move to Givani and rent a bigger house. It's a beautiful place. But if we're going to stay here, I have to become more successful. Renoir came up with an idea. He suggested that he and I should go down to the Italian Riviera and paint for a few days. So I told Alice we'd be away for 10 days. We stayed four months, during which time I painted 38 canvases. I was pleased with the results and looked forward to showing them to Alice and Duran Ruel. But when I got home, I did not get the welcome I was expecting. Where have you been, she said. You said you'd be away for 10 days, you've been away for four months. Didn't you think to write? I said, well, I've uh, been working hard. I've been living like a dog. She wasn't impressed. Still, Duran Ruel and Georges Petit, over the next two years, sold all my paintings. The next few years appeared a great change. 
but also of increasing success. My paintings are selling really well. In fact, so well that I've decided to buy this place. You've also heard that um, Alice's estranged husband, Ernst, has died. So I've decided to ask Alice to marry me. In 1891, I had an exhibition of my haystack paintings. I've now decided to paint pictures in series because what I want to do is to explore the same image at different times of the day and during different seasons. I want to see how that affects the light because I am determined to show the Impressionists what painting and capturing light on canvas is really all about. All 15 paintings in the exhibition sold for between three and five thousand francs each. Great. No, no, it's a pond. It's just a pond. I want a lake. I've employed the local builder. He's going to divert the river, which is 200 meters away, into my pond. We're going to create a lake. It's going to be stocked with lots and lots of water lily plants. He's also going to build two Japanese style bridges over the lake. It's going to look wonderful. I'm going to plant the gardens with hundreds of thousands of different species of flowers and plants. The colour's going to be brilliant. It's going to be a wonderful place to paint. I've also decided that the studio I've got is too small. I'm going to build a new studio, a big one. Because I'm going to spend the rest of my life painting and drawing here at Giverny. During the 1890s, my paintings become increasingly popular. So much so, I'm having difficulty keeping up with the clamour for my work. Luckily, prices are rising to match the demand, allowing us to live comfortably and enjoy the finer things in life. But I'm still inspired and fascinated by colour and constantly amazed by how light manipulates it. I love exploring the subtlety of colour here in my garden at Giverny because it has a quite different quality to the colour I see on the coast. Between 1899 and 1901, Alice and I made three trips to London, but this time we didn't stay in some small hotel in the East End. No, this time we stayed here, one of the best hotels in London, the Savoy. Each of our visits lasted about two months. Oh, it's so comfortable here. We would stay in this wonderful suite of rooms. They're beautiful, aren't they? I would spend most of my time looking out the window, painting. I produced 39 paintings over the three visits. Of Big Ben, of the Houses of Parliament, and the Bridges of London. Alice would complain a lot that we don't go out for a walk. In 1902, Duran Ruel held an exhibition of my 39 paintings. They sold out within three days. Back in France, I continued to be inspired by my garden and particularly my lake. For the next few years, I painted hundreds of paintings of the lake and the water lilies. But I couldn't keep up with the demand for my work. In 1908, Alice and I went on a trip to Venice. The light there was wonderful. It made the buildings look orange, the shadows blue. It was beautiful. I painted lots and lots of paintings. Unfortunately, it was the last trip Alice and I ever made because in 1911, Alice died. So I'm now on my own. Oh. The next few years were not good. In 1912 I was diagnosed with having nuclear cataracts. They make my whole world seem very yellow. 
All the colours are losing their intensity. I'm supposed to wear these glasses. I hate it. In February 1914, my son Jean died. He's just 47 years old. His wife Blanche, Alice's daughter, came to live with me. She's going to look after me, look after my affairs, which is really good. But later that year, the world fell apart. On the 12th of November 1918, the day after the armistice that ended the First World War, I sent a letter to my friend Georges Clemenceau, the Prime Minister, and offered him two of my water lily paintings. I intended them to be a gift to the nation, my monument to peace. It's now 1920 and I'm here today to see the Prime Minister because apparently decisions have been made. Ah Claude, uh, I've been thinking about your generous gift. It's been some time. I have an idea. To create two oval rooms in the Orangerie in Paris to display your paintings. Two rooms? Uh, yes. I think you should consider maybe uh, 20 paintings? George, I'm 80 years old. I'm not a young man anymore. My eyesight is failing. Do you not realize what you are asking? Oh, Claude, you are France's greatest living painter, a national treasure. A better way to celebrate your achievements. Imagine, Claude, George, your talent, your gift, your vision as a permanent memorial to those millions of your fellow countrymen who paid the ultimate sacrifice for France. I've been painting these pictures now for four years, but I keep restarting them. I keep going over bits, fiddling with bits, repainting bits. I've even destroyed a couple of paintings and started again. I'm calling my paintings La Grande Decoration. Some people refer to them as Les Nymphes. Do you know, each painting is two meters high and five meters across. They're big paintings. 20 of them. My good friend Clemenceau, the Prime Minister, keeps popping round. He keeps telling me to stop overpainting them, to finish the pictures. But I've got to get them right. He's a good man, though, Clemenceau. Sometimes he comes round in his motor car and we go out for a ride. Or occasionally, we'll go out in one of my motor cars. We like driving fast. We like speed. But my eyesight's getting worse. I had an operation in 1925. But the doctors said, I've only got 10% vision now in this eye. To see this. I can just about see it now. This eye, well, it's useless. My eyesight is now a national debate. People are writing into the papers, the newspapers, inquiring whether Monet's going to go blind. I'm almost there. Do you know I'm now so famous that some people think I'm dead? I signed the contract for these 
paintings, to finish these paintings in 1922, four years ago. Now they're finished, I have to give them up. I can't give them up. I can't give them up. This is my life. After his death, the Grand Decoration was installed in the Orangery in Paris and is still open today. Displayed within the purity of white rooms, flooded with natural light, Monet's Grand Decoration creates an atmosphere of reflection and contemplation, cocooned within the healing and soothing tranquility of nature. Monet's gift of peace to the world is the Sistine Chapel of Impressionism. Thank you.